In this episode of Non-Native Creative, I spoke with Lance Henderstein. For this interview, Lance was based in Sicily, but his work usually takes him between Italy and Japan. Lance is a copywriter with a background in photography and other artistic fields, and in university he studied East Asian languages and literature. He puts together his copywriting skills with his photography skills to produce a lot of travel-related work. So he's created travel guides and travel articles for media outlets like the BBC, Vice, and Vanity Fair Italia, to name just a few. So as you can imagine, a lot of this talk is focused on the realities of working in travel media today. We also talked about the roles and the responsibilities of photography and photographers in today's media landscape, so quite interesting. Also, full disclosure, Lance and I have been friends for many years, so this is a very straightforward talk. You'll also hear some of Lance's impressions about the differences between people who are from Japan, US, and Italy in terms of their working styles and their communication styles. You can check out Lance from the links in the description to find his homepage and where you can find him on social media. Also, for a transcript of this talk and other bonus materials, please visit patreon.com slash non-native creative. Your support will help make sure the project can continue. Enjoy! On this week's episode of Non-Native Creative, I am super excited to welcome my longtime friend, Lance Henderstein, to the show. Thank you so much for joining me from Italy today. Yeah. I'm based Sicily. in Tokyo. Yeah. 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 Sicily. Thanks. Super exciting. Yeah. It's the longest distance episode of the show so far. Congratulations. Ah, I'm already ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you already get points. You already get points. Yeah. So I'm super excited to talk to you about everything uh, that you've been up to. Uh, we met in Tokyo uh, many, many years ago and yeah, have kind of yeah. kept in touch here and there, worked together on a couple projects here and there. Yeah. You are uh, a photographer and a writer, and yeah. uh, we're going to hear all about what you've been up to and your thoughts about your international experiences today. So, <laughs> okay. Let's okay. get into it with the first question that I ask everybody in the series. All right. Yeah. The one that, that, that people often go, what is this girl talking about for? Uh, please imagine yourself as if you were a superhero. Uh, and if you had to describe your personal origin story, the thing that kicked off everything for you in your life and your creative and your international experiences, if you had an origin story, what would that be? And can you tell us? Ah, an origin story. It's kind of tough. I feel like I have these these left and right turns that like negate the, mm. the earlier stories. But um, joke answer, I guess, would be Eminem, like Eight Mile. Please <laughs> tell us pre more. Pretty similar <laughs> to my, It's essentially a biopic of my early mm. teens, but with um, more rapping for me. No. How yeah. much more rapping? It's, yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of rapping. Um, yeah, no, that's pretty similar. I mean, it was, it, my friends when that movie came out were like, have you seen this? It's, you know, it's really close. And I was uh -huh. like, oh, no. I'm going with Eminem. He's the super Eminem. For me. Okay. Yeah. So he overcame the odds and he exists in places he should not be, probably. Oh, um, okay. That's, that's, no, there I'm is nothing it. like Eminem personality wise, but like mm -hmm. that, that kind of where you just go totally culturally off. Um, okay from where people expect you to be, maybe it works. Gotcha. Sorry, it's not, not so No, but I, I think that yeah. we, can, we, can, can, we can come back to that a little bit later for sure. Yeah, I don't know. Growing up, I was you know, born in Detroit. Um, I moved a ton as a kid, so I was like always back and forth, moving mm -hmm. all around. So needed to make friends quickly. My friend groups were obviously really diverse and, and you know, not typical for, mm -hmm. I think, someone who looks like me you know what mm -hmm. I mean like the, it doesn't jive with how I appear like the way I grew up um so it's maybe formative in that way like um you got to make friends quickly you got to ingratiate yourself you have to be a little bit overly confident and I think uh definitely my younger days it was like you know a cockiness that kind of brash American mm -hmm. cockiness that you need it's obviously it's a defense mechanism I think you know any teenager Sure, that. sure. And then hopefully you grow out of it, although that's not guaranteed these days. <laughs> no, and no. it may be not even beneficial these days. Um, okay, but that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. You know, like that ability yeah. to quickly get to you know build networks in your community, and like you said, you had a diverse kind of friend group growing up. Yeah. So what was it that sort of led you to thinking? Like I know you studied um, East Asian. You had East Asian studies was kind of yeah. Like it's group. like a linguistics Japanese. It's a double major, essentially. Yeah. So how how did you get there specific. through uh, through Oof. you know growing up in different places and so on? What what kind of yeah. brought you to that topic? 
I was always interested in like um, in in the way people spoke. Uh, so I grew up in Detroit in like on the border. We're on the border with Windsor, Canada. Like you can literally look across the river and see Canada. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the um, a lot of the media, like our radio stations, um, a tons of Canadian TV. It's just terrestrial TV. It wasn't even like, you know, cable or anything. It's just regular beamed over. Mm -hmm. So I didn't I didn't realize that there were Canadian shows. I was just watching them. Like, uh, you can't do that on television or Mr. Dress Up. I'm aging myself a bit here. But and Americans, you have no, right? You never even heard of these shows. Um, no. So these were on and I noticed how they talked. Like they would say uh, dollar and like all the, you know, all the oh the canadian, canadian things like sorry and they, they just had a very clipped way of speaking and okay. i thought i had like a an incorrect accent because they're on tv so they must be legit right oh okay but it like kind of clicked on for me i'm like why wait why does my grandpa have this weird accent i don't have this accent like everyone's talks different are we choosing mm -hmm. i remember thinking about this all the time and then doing impressions a ton of impressions when i was a kid, uh -huh. of everybody around or people on tv um and so I think the, li the linguistic thing was, was clicked on early and then moving a lot, obviously moved to California when I was a kid and then Florida and then back to Michigan and then up mm -hmm. North Michigan, back to Detroit. Wow. And noticing that there were differences everywhere I went, like everyone said, did something different or had different mm. words that they were choosing. Um, so I've always been interested in that and always asking why, 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 you know, like mm -hmm. really overly curious probably to the, chagrin of my teachers growing up that they always like <laughs> stop asking why just memorize okay. everything so was there some kind of moment that you were exposed to like japanese media or to uh, asian you know art or history or something yeah i was never into like anime or anything like that but my grandfather um fought in the pacific theater and was like in the battle of okinawa he's in the air force uh, he actually volunteered for the air force which seems insane Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have he didn't have to go he got into some engineering program he could have gone to Stanford and just like hung out for the war um, but quit and decided to to volunteer so he ended up in Okinawa and then at GHQ um, for a year or something when he's like you know, he's mm -hmm. like 20 or something at this point and uh, I, I mean that's not the reason why but I guess that must have kind of you know flipped a switch or something to let me know that that existed and that there was some kind of family connection to it. Mm -hmm. Later it made, it was cool because it had depth and I went to the places he went to like Hanamaki and like, you know, all these, um, you know, places in Tohoku where they, the, the soldiers were. And uh, yeah, that was weird. Like, you know, kind of a circle mm. of things. Um, and then I really didn't think about it. I always wanted to be bilingual. Definitely. So I assumed it would be like Spanish or something useful. In America. <laughs> Sorry, not to say the Japanese. You know what I mean, though. You know what I mean? It's, it's an isolated language. Like Spanish, I can speak in, you know, how many countries to how many. Yeah, yeah. Though I have people. found that knowledge of Japanese has allowed me here and there uh, to understand things that are written in, in Chinese. For sure. Even if I can't read it, I can at least I at least know the characters and I'm like, oh, yeah, two for one with this language. <laughs> so. Yeah, it definitely is helpful um, in Asia, but just in America, from an American centric sure. point of view, sure. I assume Spanish, you know, of course, it's the Western Hemisphere. Probably um, a little more useful or a little more, mm, it's probably a little, there are more opportunities to use it. Well, depending you, on which part. Did you have a language is. that you studied before Japanese? Did you? Yeah, I studied, uh, I also studied Spanish because at my Spanish, high school, yeah. well, I just, I just took whatever language class was available to me at, at any point in my life. Like when I was in uh, yeah. middle school, it was like, we had like this in Egypt, you know, we had like the, the junior high school part where you learned about, you know, like Egypt and ancient Greece and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. And when we right. got to the Egypt part, my teacher handed out these, um, like little it's like one page worksheets that were hieroglyphic study sheets <laughs> and they were essentially just like bird equals a <laughs> like dog yeah. equals c and i was just like yes this is so yeah. awesome i'm learning actual hieroglyphics and i was like write my dad notes in that stuff so it's like it wasn't a real language but that was like those kinds of things like whatever was available yeah. for language and stuff i was studying it so yeah that was the first time but it feels like it was always it was always in you right like you always wanted to do it there was no like thing that made you go like oh i need to it was just like i want to this it was curiosity. more like it's a puzzle it's something oh, okay. to figure out you know like yeah, i like that yeah, yeah. but then yeah there was a, a french slash spanish there was a romance languages introduction course when i was in eighth grade 
took okay. that and then Spanish in uh, high school for two years and then uh, started studying Japanese after the Spanish classes ran out. I just started studying oh, really? Japanese on my own. Oh, yeah, just, we, there was no more available, so. Yeah, yeah, so oh. I moved on to Japanese, uh, yeah, junior year of high school, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. So were you learning Japanese at a school? Were you taking some kind of Japanese lessons like in, in, in university as you were studying East Asia? Yeah, university was, my major was linguistics and Japanese. So like, okay. uh, it was like half and half. I realized quickly that, well, I went, okay. I went to art school first and I dropped out because it was too expensive. So there's a center for creative studies in Detroit. It's college for creative studies now. It's a really good design school. And I got in there, they gave me like, oh, they gave me $10,000 scholarship, but like, you know, tuition's like 40. Mm. And then supplies for art school. And then I have to live downtown, so I have to rent. It's like, you know, I'm looking at $100,000 just, you know, in the first couple of years or first year. So it was just like, I grew up really poor. So those numbers just hit me like, uh, this, is, this is insane. I'm not right. doing this. Um, as you know, as an American, sticker shock, you know, is, is real for college. Yeah, and the, uh, the educational experience is often extremely expensive in the USA. Like people yep. kind of expect to graduate with just often just a lifetime of debt. So Yeah, you just, you just, you just factor it away. I'm going to be in debt. Um, but I was like, maybe I can minimize this. So uh, I was eligible for scholarships in Michigan because I was like a ward of the state. It's kind of like an orphan. Um, oh, okay. So I was eligible for scholarships. Somebody I went to a state school. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go to state school, cut my costs in like a third of what I'm paying now. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to study art at a state school because it's not good, right? So or in my mind. Okay. Um, yeah. So I just switched to language. And um, then I was like, oh, I, can, I can study abroad at cost. Like my, oh, my counselor okay. was like, you realize we have a free study abroad, like to Japan or wherever you want to go, really. We have like the biggest study abroad program, Michigan State. So wow. I was like, ah, oh, this is like jackpot. I can just travel for, you know, I, I figured I would never be able to do it. Um, sure. So that's yeah, I was actually, like, okay. That's so one I of those things. half my time over you have to You have to take advantage of those things. I had a, like, uh, while I was in university too, there were like, you know, study abroad programs in my school. Uh, I was at the University of Oregon, but there was also like these internships and I actually deferred graduation for a semester just so I could participate. Cause I was like, once I graduate, the opportunity has gone. Totally. So I, like, it's I so gotta smart. go now. <laughs> I just yeah. gotta go. So I just deferred graduation for a term and worked it all out. Um, like I had my parents to support me and thankfully like, you know, uh, yeah, it, was very, it was very like privileged to have that. Uh, but yeah, I was like, oh my God, if I don't do this, I'll regret it, I'm sure. It'll be one of those, I'm gonna wonder for the rest of my life situations. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. where did you go for your study, Brad? Japan. I mean, obviously uh, Japan, but like yeah, what city? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shiga, Shiga, Hikone, Shiga, Japan. It's on Shiga. Lake Iwa. Yeah, Shiga. yeah. Shiga, so this for Countryside. anyone, yeah, not familiar with Japan, this is not Tokyo. <laughs> it's not no, Osaka, this not, no. This is uh, real countryside, and not only countryside, like uh, industrial, working class kind of, you know, okay. um, there's a lot of factories and stuff down there. Um, but it was great because it's, uh, it's tied in with all Michigan universities. So it was like, you're in a dormitory all together studying, the teaching staff is great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're in the middle of nowhere. So anytime you go out, you know, you're, you're speaking a form of Japanese. It's a, it's Kansai event for sure. So uh, like, you know, okay, I was gonna the, ask, yeah, like about yeah. the Japanese that you were learning. Oh uh, yeah, you you were deep Kansai. So um, the teachers were always having to correct us because we don't, you know, you know how it goes, man. You watch TV and it's like all Osaka guys and yeah. For those not familiar with Japan and Japanese dialects, there's the kind of cool uh, the the TV the entertainment style um, Japanese, which is called uh, Kansai Ben. So Ben means like dialect in this context. Uh, so Osaka Ben or Kansai Ben means like dialect from Osaka or dialect from the Kansai region of Japan. So this is kind of looser and rougher and cooler sounding than what yeah. we uh, in Kanto, the east part of Japan and Tokyo speak. So I mean, the, 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 the common refrain is that living in the countryside is far better for development of your language skills than living in a place like Tokyo. Was that, mm. oh, you're making a face that makes me think that wasn't necessarily true. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it depends on how countryside and depends on how, like in this case, I'm surrounded by foreigners in the dorm, right? So like mm -hmm. we're all from Michigan as okay. well. So we have similar backgrounds, most of us. Um, there were a few Japanese people in the dorm as well, like learning English. So that was weird, mm -hmm. um, older people, not older, but you know, older than students. Um, 
less opportunities to speak or meet Japanese people because there's just less people, right? So mm -hmm. um, there was like a bar next to the place that everybody hung out called Tsukimoto's and that was a good chance people knew that the, that our students hung out there so they would come to try and practice English. Okay. This, but no, I mean, I, I did a semester there and I was like, oh, maybe I can actually, I never thought I could actually learn Japanese. Mm -hmm. I honestly just thought I'd take it and it would look cool on my resume. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I was like, oh, it's gonna look great. Like people are gonna be so impressed. It was like uh -huh. a very egotistical reason for doing it, a hard language. Um, but then I did, as soon as I left that semester, I was like, oh, I can do this. Like I can definitely learn this language for sure. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard speaking. Uh, writing is tough, but. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna come back for a whole year by myself. Mm -hmm. So I pitched, I guess this is my first big pitch really weirdly. I pitched to my program uh, an independent study where I would get double the credit. So I'd basically get a year because I was behind a year from art school. So I was like, I'll get double the credits and I'll do one whole year in Japan at a language school. And then at like Hosei University for like, that's our sister school. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I couldn't believe it, they took it. Wow. Yeah, and then I got a, a Freeman Asia scholarship, which is a great uh, scholarship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Write an essay. I, so I got that. I couldn't believe that. I just wrote an essay about my grandpa or something, and like they gave it to me. It was like eight grand, you know? So I was like, oh, that's my living expenses. This is wow. I thought. It was not my living expenses. <laughs> <laughs> in for Tokyo. a year? Mm. Yeah, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Covered rent for like six months. <laughs> uh, but I was very happy cool. to get it. I've never yeah. heard of someone pitching their program yeah. a, a, a study abroad thing. That's very, how did you come up with that idea? I just, I wanted to do a year, but I wanted to do intensive language study. Like I wanted to language, language, language all day long. And I couldn't find any programs that allowed for that. They all made me do like Ikebana or something. And I was like, uh, flower arranging. Like I, I just wanted to, oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to, you know, language only. Mm. Um, mm. And I want to live on my own so that I can, like really immerse and, and feel like I'm living there, not like I'm some dependent student. Um, and yeah, so they went for it. Um, cool. So you yeah. ended up, you said Jose University? So we're, yeah. we're where's well, that? The morning, I was doing, actually there's a, my main study, <laughs> I didn't do anything at Jose, nothing. It was like a joke. Um, I just hung out in the lunchroom essentially. They gave me essays occasionally. Um, Jose's in Ichigaya, um, oh, okay. in the middle of Tokyo. And then, what was the name of the school? I'm forgetting the name of my language school. KCP International, no which idea. is tied in with Lincoln University, which is a historically black college in, in the US mm -hmm. and Idaho University or something like that. They have a okay. really good program. Highly recommend it for anybody who wants to do three months. It's a little more expensive um, than the others, but like the teachers there are the ones who teach the other Japanese teachers. So it's like the it's the place that j people who want to be Japanese teachers study. Okay. So they're, they're very solid. And, um, you do not cheat there. Like you can't jump up a level. You, you can't phone in tests. If you miss a test, you have to take it until you pass. Like mm -hmm. it's just, it's very, very strict. Mm -hmm. um, and there weren't at that time many Western students. There were a lot of Korean, Chinese, Sri Lankan, and not only the people from like Lincoln University or American University. So it mm -hmm. really isolates you. And uh, yeah, I mean, it really, that solidified my language skills, I think. Okay, so you took that time. year to kind of, to really build up your language skills and like, I assume also get more comfortable living in like city Japan. Yep. Uh, so I assume then like once you, once you had that language skills, you're like, all right, I want to put this to work, you know, literally and start working nope. in Japan. Did you move directly <laughs> into working? No. What did you do after that? I wasted it for three years. Uh, really? I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I do this a lot. This is a, a bad habit. This is, if you want some advice, don't do that. Um, stick with stuff. I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I was like, okay, cool. I did that now. <clears throat> I got to be realistic and, you know, keep working. So I got a job out of college working for CBS radio. And I was going to do radio, dying industry, really dumb. No one saw, po no one saw a podcast coming um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> at this time. So Okay. <clears throat> so I was living in Los Angeles. This is like also, by the way, like the worst economic situation in, this is like the deep so doldrums, 2005. 2005, okay. Yeah, I'm old. So yeah, it's 2005. So I was like, there's no jobs, man. 
and uh, no one's hiring. So I uh -huh. took the first one I got, which was good, CBS radio, just doing board and editing. And I was living in LA, which I hated. I didn't. Uh, yeah, like right your, your comment earlier about, you know, expenses and life expenses. When you said you were living in LA, I was like, that can't have been cheap. <laughs> Like, it's still not cheap. Better than, like, New York or San Francisco or something, which I just thought you can't, you know, mm. unless you have a trust fund or something. I um, see. So what brought yes. you back to Japan in the end, then? Uh, yeah, I burnt out in L.A., honestly. Mm. And uh, I quit. I just quit. Like, I walked into my the office one day and was just like, I'm done. Mm. And uh, I just got burnt out. It's a... Uh, it's but Yeah, it is costly if you consider, like, car costs and... Yeah, I don't know. It just wasn't working. I, I, I had a bunch of friends who moved out of there out there from Michigan after that, and they all loved it, and they're still living there, and they're doing great. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it just wasn't a fit. I always saw myself in, like, you know, Chicago or Okay, so you hopped Seattle, on a plane back Vancouver. to Tokyo or something. So I literally just was like, my dad was like, why don't you just take a vacation? You like, you like Japan. Why don't you go see your friends and just take a couple weeks off and decide where you want to move next? As soon as I got on, like, Narita Express, the, like, you know, train that goes from the airport i just sat down and the lady brought the tea it's just like ah like i'm gonna stay for a year so at what point did you start working as a photographer oh uh were yeah you doing, I, did you do the I english always, teaching thing for a while i did yeah um not alt uh i was at an international school teaching returnees like kids who had lived abroad yeah and then came back so they're essentially american or australian or english kids um Shibuya Makahari is the school. I don't know. It's pretty kind of known. Um, but that was good. I, I think if I had just been an ALT, I would have left like after a year or something. Or I would have changed jobs, mm -hmm. like became a copywriter or something like that quicker. Um, mm -hmm. But I got that job and it was really, really enjoyable, like more than I ever thought. Because I was teaching in English. I was teaching writing. I wasn't teaching like ABCs. So it was like essentially like being a junior high school teacher in America or something. Oh, okay. Better, better behaved kids. Uh, for okay. sure. You know, a bunch of little nerds. They were great. I loved them. Um, and it was very, very satisfying in a way that I totally did not predict. Like, I really mm -hmm. enjoyed it, um, especially because at that age, I didn't, like, I had such a different life from them that I had a lot of good kind of things I could could express to them and help them get through their, you know, 14 is the worst age, I think. Or Returnees one of are a fun group, for sure. They're, they're really great, yeah. Do they ever ask um, you, do you have any, I know for my returnee group, <laughs> Uh, yeah. I remember a couple of real good questions they asked me. Do you have any? Like, they like they just ask you something so bizarre. <laughs> My uh -huh. favorite question probably no, just came from, he must have been 10 at the time, the returnee kid. Yeah. <laughs> Once in the middle of a lesson, he asked me, did Hitler walk on the moon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Where did that come from? Yeah. And that one, I just, it's just stuck it forever in my you mind. Would, yeah, you would get a lot of stuff like that because it's like they have all the, the, the base knowledge and then they a lot of times don't have the filter, the social filters uh, built in yet, you know, because they're young, they're little kids. And like, whereas if they said that in, you know, America, people would be like, you can't say that or they would get some reaction. But here they can just. I don't or know. I, and and I think it's just yeah. in the setting with, you know, a, a teacher, you know, that it's sort of. <laughs> You know, an outsider that you can get away with asking. Silly <laughs> yeah, <things like> that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one's always stuck yeah. in my mind. So you were doing that for a while, and then like, did yeah. you pick up photography as kind of a as kind of a hobby? That's uh, yeah, it's still mixed up. I studied, I did study photography for uh, the the year, uh, the first year of university. So I studied mm -hmm. black and white, did darkroom, all that. Mm -hmm. uh, went to Japan for my study abroad after quitting art school and didn't have a camera, and was you know, I, I stupidly, I should have just bought a camera, obviously. Um, but I had been borrowing my parents and I thought they would let me take it with them, with me. And they were like, no. And I was like, hmm, fine. Then I, you know, I won't anymore. Um, so I was always taking photos um, for myself and for my family and that kind of thing. Um, after I finished teaching, um, I did a, I prototyped like a program. I was going to go get my master's or like continue education or something. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe go get a master's in photography or something like that. Uh, and my friend sent me this new program, which is now kind of a gap year program for Stanford design school. Mm -hmm. At this time, it was like just a startup, um, called experience Institute, which is not the most grabbing name, but, um, that sounds familiar actually. Yeah. They're, doing good stuff they do stuff with like leo burnett in in uh in the states a big ad firm um something with berkeley now mm -hmm. and other things so they, they basically give 
people who are in very specific majors or, you know, design or something like that, who want to try something totally left field for a year, get some experience, but also get paid to do it because, you know, obviously unpaid internships are the devil. Don't do them uh, if you can. If you Doer of an unpaid internship. Right uh, well, at that time, that was all there was. But yeah. nowadays, I think, yeah, people should get paid. Um, Ideally. So yeah, I helped. so I was like, okay, I'll try this. So I did that for a year. So I was working as a copywriter, as a photographer, as like I did, you know, three different jobs, three months, mm. uh, three months, three month contracts, like proper contracted jobs. Just what it essentially taught me how to freelance. It was like a freelance program. And then I obviously helped them prototype what to do in the future and what works and doesn't mm -hmm. work and what I liked and didn't like. And um, it's kind of an exchange. Uh, and oh, then okay. from then, from there, I just kept freelancing. And because I had experienced copywriting now and also experience uh, with photography, like I had enough to show people, mm -hmm. uh, I just kept doing that and just didn't stop. So I've just yeah. been freel freelancing ever since. But okay. it's, always, it's always like some copywriting because the pay is much better. Mm -hmm. And then photography, you know, at first doing like travel stuff and mm -hmm. talk about that yep. um, because, it was, because it was accessible. You know, yeah. I, could, I could do it. Um, I didn't have to stop my life for four months and in bed with, you know, a group in a, a conflict zone or something like that. I couldn't, I couldn't afford that or do it. Um, so I started with travel uh, and street because it's available to keep you shooting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then obviously I haven't, I don't know, I've, I've veered away from the travel stuff mm -hmm. for sure. Um, simply because it doesn't pay. Uh, the okay. dirty secret the dirty secret is you will not make a living as an editorial photographer unless you are one of the editorial photographers and you probably have some other income or I a spouse see. a spouse or yeah, <coughs> a yeah, trust the, fund or something the, the travel uh, especially in today's economic climate and when i say that i mean you know with a pandemic like it's not a good time to be in the travel writing and travel media industry. Oh, I mean, I wish people would just talk about rates, like just talk about how much you get paid mm -hmm. and then you, you know, it doesn't add up. I mean, this is why people live in places like, you know, Mexico city or Chiang Mai or like these kind of expat hotspots because yeah. Okay. You make 10, $15,000 a year uh, doing occasional editorials. Um, in this case, you're doing a lot of editorials if that's all you're doing, which I mm -hmm. doubt most people are. I feel like everyone's doing some copywriting like every, or copy yeah, editing on the side. They just don't way. talk about it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or they're with their spouse and, it, and you know, it, or they have free rent or in some, some way built in or right. something. Like I do, I do here, I'll be honest. Like, you know, like my partner, we, we have a tiny little one room place that our parents own in Catania. It's a relatively cheap place, no rent okay, well then combine our incomes and we're doing pretty good, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. um, but that's absolutely try true. Try and do that in London or in yeah. Brooklyn. You're a liar. I, They're not doing that. There's no I way. I think that like the appeal, the big appeal of the travel writer thing is being able to, you know, take the photo of your laptop, you know, working from your laptop in like, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, Bali, Indonesia somewhere. Be like, just writing up this article, hashtag digital yeah. nomad, you know, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. I think that there's a certain Oh, look, the check from grandpa came, you know, like, yay. <laughs> but I also think that like for, for and I, but I don't necessarily think that if you're, if you're, you know, like a college student or maybe you're taking a gap year, I don't necessarily yeah. see a problem with that. No, 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 absolutely not. I think it's good if you're able to do it. Yeah, but I do see experience things and build a network and that's those are actually ne like now thinking about that like those are all very very valuable things to do uh, but yeah. to think of it as a sustainable forever career like you say like you've got to be real special I think uh, in yeah. order to make that possible because yeah. like the For travel example, stuff like, that I've know. done I just plan okay. to make yeah. it like if I make it break even I'm happy like yeah. if I get to write a piece yeah. and go somewhere and the, the payment for the piece will cover my stay and cover yep. like my transportation costs of getting there, then I'm like, cool. Like I got to have this yeah. essentially like free experience and yep. I have to write about it now. And that's yeah. it. Like that's, so for me, that's, I, that's what I consider a successful. Yeah. And this is, you know, the, the whole fam trip thing. I don't know if uh, your listeners are familiarity like trip. Like when you get, it, the trip is paid for essentially by the local government or something else. Uh, you basically, they cover your costs and oh. then you write about it. 
It, is but this like, is common in Japan. It's like the yeah, way it's is that done. like the one you invited me to a group, exactly. uh, like a PR thing? Uh, you yep. were doing photography for that, and I was just supposed to be there, like in pictures from time to time. Yeah, uh, so they, up to Niigata. Niigata, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this is the way it's done in Japan, but you are not. <clears throat> excuse me. You're not allowed um, to accept free hotel, free trip, free transportation for outfits like New York Times. BBC travel, um, you're not allowed. So you, it's a, it's a dirty secret. I mean, they oh. did the, what, the 52, the guy went to 52 places in a year or whatever. And everyone who has been to any of those places, you know, ostensibly New York Times is fitting the budget for this and they're not paid by any local, but he's doing itineraries that are clearly the same ones that other people had done as familiarity trips or as PR trips. So I think it's kind of like wink and nod at this point. Whereas it used to be, I went to this uh, Italian uh, photography exhibit and it was like from the forties or fifties or something like that early. Mm -hmm. And this, and this guy, they had the story of how he got this story. And it was like, you know, the magazine put him up for three months in this small town, you know, gave him a, a daily stipend of like whatever was exorbitant at the time. So he could, you know, live like a king and be with the locals for three months. I mean, that doesn't exist anymore. You don't get per diems and this kind of stuff. Not much. You do. You can, but it's very rare. Yeah. And, uh, or now it's like I would say now the shift I would, has kind of been towards uh, less towards writing, perhaps, and like there's a big shift towards the content creator or influencer yeah. industry these yeah. days. It seems. So yeah, you like need to they, do all. Yeah, there are these uh, you know uh, content creators or people who run like big Instagram accounts that can take these gorgeous photos these lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know, appealing lifestyle photos and those, you know, are, there's trackable information and yeah. uh, all kinds of data SEO that, you and, know, yeah. that yeah, hotels yeah. can use to determine <clears throat> whether it's successful or not. So yeah, the, yeah. as the, as the industry shifts for sure, and as consumer behavior shifts as well, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's natural to see that kind of shift happen, sure. but at the same time, it's also important, I think in, in the case that you're talking about and in the case of yeah. like the influencer content creator type content to always keep in your mind this is probably not real <laughs> like this is yeah. probably not a real experience well i mean this proved it it's not sustainable really unless you're already in a place that needs a ton of content which in that case is probably expensive uh more expensive you know what i mean um mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't travel around right now. So how can you sustain yourself? I think you need to always have something that you can rely on. I don't want to say mm. fall back on because that sucks. That sounds like your parents. Um, but it's, <laughs> you know, you need something to fall back on. You go get that business degree. Don't make get sure that you, business degree. Uh, make no, sure you have do a, not do have, that. Have the, my, my approach has always been have the stable thing. Like even if yes. it's not your favorite thing, have yes. the stable thing and make sure that the stable thing allows you to have enough time to do the unstable things. Yes. And then if the unstable thing takes off, great, grab that yeah. and make it your next stable yeah, thing. Yeah. That's kind of my strategy. That's, I kind yep. of leapfrog around that way. Absolutely the same. Absolutely the same. I always have that little back in my back pocket. I have a copywriting portfolio that I can get work right. with and if right. I need to. You know, There's always hopefully. a skill set, hopefully, a marketable hopefully thing. Hopefully that stays. Yeah, I don't <laughs> okay. know. I'm, yeah. Um, so let's I, then talk. Like, what? The, yeah. So we're obviously uh, you're you're talking from Italy today. So what made Italian, you think? Yeah. All right, I'm done. I'm done with with Japan. I'm done with all this. Never. Like, all your I'm not. I'm not done with Japan. I still love Japan. It's my second home. Um, oh. I think from from next year, if if it allows, I'm gonna. I'm. I'll be splitting time. I'll be doing about half and half. Okay. Uh, between here and there. Um, luckily I have a very understanding partner who's okay with that and uh, okay. will come with me and she loves Japan too. So it's like, we, cool. we, we do well over there. Um, nice. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm not done with Japan. I mean, obviously the reason I'm here is cause I met a girl when I was working. So that's how it goes. There you uh, go. There those you Italian, go. Italian Sicilian girls will get you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I wanted to give it a try. I did also always want to live in Europe at some point. I wanted mm. to give it a, an honest try. I don't know if Sicily quite is the Europe I was imagining for myself. Yeah, I wanted honest. to ask you, like, how does, how does your life in Europe, how does your life there compare to your life in Japan? Like, I, I was thinking, like, uh, it, must be, it must be quite a shock, like, yeah. the differences. 
More than I expected, yeah, because I had been here for the expo. That was when I first came with a Japanese company uh, called Peace Kitchen. Umari, they were doing like food stuff. Oh, you met my yeah. boss. Yeah, I met them. Yeah, yeah. Hima. Yeah. yeah. So I was doing stuff for them for expo. And then I was like, you know, oh, this is a nice place, but I, I definitely wouldn't live here. I mean, there's no, no I don't speak Italian. I don't, mm. there's no reason for me to, to do it. So I was back and forth between here and there, Milan okay. and Tokyo because it's so cheap to fly from Milan to Tokyo is like crazy cheap. So I was like, oh, this is sustainable. I could, yeah, it was like, I got tickets for like $400 round trip, $600 round trip regularly. I think because they have two airports in both cities, I don't know. Um, but it was really, really cheap. And I was like, oh, this is totally sustainable. Eventually it started to become like, ah, oh, baby, this is too taxing on a relationship. Mm. So I was like, maybe this isn't fair actually. Um, so I, there's an agency a photo agency here who um, my partner had introduced me to and they were like very keen to like work together. And I was like, great. Um, this is kind of my first experience with big promises, uh, no delivery in Italy. Okay. Common. I feel, and I'm going to, sorry guys, <laughs> this is my viewpoint only. This is my experience. For this does not speak is, for everybody. He is, he is attempting just to. Just my personal experience. <laughs> Stereotypes are coming, guys. Yeah, if um, you're just listening, this is, this is a, no, I won't <laughs> your go, mileage I won't go may too, vary. Yeah. I, I, I won't go too far. Um, face to face, big promises here. A lot of big promises. They want to do big things genuinely. Mm -hmm. they, you know, the same way Americans, very similar to Americans. Like I got big ideas. I want to do these big things. You and me, we're going to work together. It's going to be great. Yeah. Awesome. Um, the tendency is I think Americans feel like deep, deep, deep uh, fear and obligation of not backing that up a little bit. Like it burns your reputation, right? Uh, we have pride. <laughs> yeah, self-pride. What a concept. Yeah, no, you do. You feel like my word is my bond. And if I don't back this up, I'm going to look like a liar or, mm -hmm. or uh, just a blowhard. Um, Italy, I think either, either they, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes because I'm not privy because I don't speak Italian. So maybe it's, it's partly my fault as well. But like, they will, it'll, it'll just not happen. <clears throat> and you'll be like in the planning stages and it'll just not happen. And they'll be like, sorry, maybe we'll try next year. And you're like, I just invested like, you know, two months in this thing that I thought was going ahead. And then it's just like, oof. And uh, mm. I don't know if that's the, the red tape because there is a lot of bureaucracy here. I don't know if it's just like, they get excited, they're excitable. So they get excited about the idea and they really want to do it. But then when they can't, they get ashamed. And so they, they just put it away and just, they won't respond to emails. As in like, are you saying like, they, you just get ghosted? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, a lot of ghosting here. And especially with like payments and this kind of thing was just shocking to me because, you know, the States, Japan, they pay, you know what I mean, generally. Mm -hmm. like I yeah. want to uh, ask you a bit about your photos, though. Okay. So yeah. uh, you said that you'd studied uh, photography, specifically black and white photography, uh, yeah. and you had been, uh, you talked about doing some travel photography um, yeah. as well. But is, I wanted to ask if there's like a specific kind of look that you're going for, or some kind of uh, like specific vibe or atmosphere that you are trying to evoke in your yeah photos. yeah i definitely don't like explicit kind of informational photographs for myself i mm -hmm. like looking at them i love like good reportage and stuff like that but mm -hmm. um i want like a hint or like uh i want to leave enough room i want it to be ambiguous like so okay. if i'm shooting in japan i kind of don't want it to look like japan mm. I like, avoid cliches. Like I don't want cliches. You can't avoid them entirely. You're going to get them. Um, but I don't want like, you know, the salary men on the zebra stripe, the blade runner, purple stuff. I don't want that. Like I, it's, it's, you can do it. It's, it's more marketable for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But I just want to hint. I want like, <clears throat> I don't want to explain, <clears throat> excuse me. I, the, there's a volcano behind me about a mile behind me and it's, puffing away with uh, some some good dust. Oh, it. are you allergic um, to volcano? Apparently I am. <laughs> no, I never knew this, uh, but yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, I don't like overly explicit. I, I like, you know, it's like poems are great. A great example, I guess. Like, you don't want a poet poem to be like, and this is what I mean, you know? Yeah, that's true. That kind of ruins Ugh, it, doesn't it? Just, or <laughs> yeah. like the end of a movie where it's like, and they all live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Gross. Or it was all just a dream. Yeah. Um, yeah. In photography too, so, so much stuff um, 
again, just opinions, but like so much stuff is very explicit now. And <clears throat> probably because of <clears throat> so many people going to art school nowadays um, and the Instagram effect, like everyone having access, this is a good thing. Cause you know, I grew up a poor kid. I would love to have this kind of, I would love to have a smartphone when I was a teenager. I would, I would have had a completely different trajectory. Um, but you get a lot of the same look. There's a formula and it's really easy. You can do that formula. You can just see it. You get a million examples. Whereas you used to have to go to like a library or even on the internet, you had to find who it was that did certain kinds of work. And maybe you copy a little bit, but you can't do it perfectly. Now you can do it perfectly quite easily. Um, and it, so it, a lot of stuff gets very samey samey and I think mm. very advertising. And I mm. think the line, the line between art and advertising has gotten so blurred that I don't think anyone can see the difference. Oh, not anybody, but a lot of people don't care really. They're like, what's the mm. difference? Who cares? I like that photo. And I'm like, well, good, that's fine. But I think, you know, someone who's probably doing galleries or something like that can tell the difference but even they, I think, have started to like very, pre not predictable, but sterile, kind of uh, okay. clean. Everything's very clean, you know what I mean? Because digital is so easy. It's, the images are so crispy mm. and like perfect. And um, I mean, I can see the eyelash, you know, if it's on here, it's like mm -hmm. from a million miles away. It's so, so hyper real. It's almost like for me, it's like chewing on tinfoil a lot of times when I see that very hyper clear, uh, sharp photo, I, I just like it. I, I find myself trying to dumb everything down so it looks dark and kind of not as overt. Um, mm. If I that makes sense. I'm yeah, rambling actually, totally, but this no, is, I feel actually, strongly about this. Like, no, that was, that was, I was looking for, for, yeah, kind of your perspective on that. Because like when I see your photos on Instagram or Twitter or something like that, I have, I've, I've, there've been times when I'm just like, what is going on in this picture, Lance? Like, why did you choose this picture? <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I don't I know hope, what I'm looking so. at here. It'll be like, it'll yeah. be like a reflection <laughs> on like a window and I can kind of half yeah. see a lady's face inside. And I'm just like, how I've often wondered like what is the thought process in in finding these or like you posted one recently that was like I think of a garden somewhere like I want it looked kind of like rainy uh, season yeah. uh yeah. like in a pond maybe and it was it was like it could have been someplace in Japan but it could have been uh, someplace yeah. else too yeah that and was, was like, like uh, well that was interesting because I like that it made me think and so I was like yeah I like that was one. just an iPhone photo too as well it's just like you know and then I just darkened it um mm -hmm. yeah I mean, first thing is light. Honestly, it sounds, it's a cliche, but I really just like, okay, there's good light there. Maybe there's something I can do with it. Um, with the reflex reflections, yeah. I mean, I was using reflections a lot. I'm sort of trying to not get in that too much of a habit. Um, yeah, but the you puddle can use, photo. You can use like mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, window reflections and different uh, distortions. I mean, I'm trying to distort the photo a little bit so it's not so obvious. I see. Um, of but course, a beautiful portrait is a beautiful portrait, so good. Yeah. Like, nice clean portrait. That's classic. It should, you should shoot that as Sure. Well. But yeah. uh, this question actually leads into, this leads very nicely into uh, the question that I received uh, on Patreon for you. Uh, oh, former, a former interviewee. Former interviewee. Okay. Uh, Sharif, hey Sharif, if you're listening. Sharif is a comic artist. He's a dentist cool. slash cartoonist who has been on the series. He runs a, a very uh, entertaining uh, comic series uh, awesome. called Gaijin Falafel in um, oh, cool. Magazine, if you've ever seen it. Anyway, I will, I will he it wanted to ask you, uh, what is photography's biggest strength as an art form and what is its weakness? Oh, as an art form. Mm. Um, its biggest strength is accessibility, I think. That's the first thing. I mean, anyone can take a photo, presumably. You got to, how good it will be, who knows, but like, you can really just, you know, click or on your phone, you can just click and then there it is. Um, I think that's good, uh, really good because it used to be, you know, I mean, just cost, man. I, I don't know. I, you know, I grew up really poor. So I have this like really deep class angst and I really get harumphy with, uh, you know, people who are like, oh, this is so, oh, I know. And there is a difference, there is a difference. I'm not denying that, but it shouldn't be a difference because you can't do it, because you can't afford to do it or because you didn't go to art school and you don't have the qualifications. I think the great thing now is that like, if you're good, you're good. And 
you can have an old iPhone 5S. I mean, some of the best photos I feel I, feel I took were on my, you know, an iPhone 4S or something, and it's, it's all muddled, and it just looks old. It looks good. It looks unique. Um, that's a good thing. That's the strength mm-hmm. of photography. It's accessible to everybody. That's also the weakness is because you have a lot of people doing it who think or just can't see. I mean, you, it's, an, it's a skill. You have to develop what looks good or what you want to shoot or what, there are rules. You know, you can break them, but you need to know them. The classic mm-hmm. thing. Uh, weakness too is it's commercialized. And like we were just talking about, it's, it's been so bled together that like people can't see the difference anymore. I mean, it used to be a scandal to shoot color because color was for advertising, right? Oh, really? I didn't In know that. In the 60s, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you get like, you know, Winograd and all these other people. And uh, 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 anyway, a lot of people that s- started doing advertising and then you, they were like, I like this result with the color, I'm going to switch. You weren't a serious photographer if you shot color. Now mm-hmm. it's just a silly, now it's an affectation to shoot black and white, right? Actually, like, yeah, I've thought that a couple times. Like every once in a while, I'll be like, you know what? I like this picture in black and white, but I'm like, is this going to look pretentious? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean... I mean, it's good for war and stuff because it makes it stark. You know, it makes it, it, uh, it feels, we have an association that that's a serious issue. It doesn't. I see. That's interesting. I, mean, this, I, I much prefer but, a juxtaposition. I will take the silliest picture possible and throw it in black <laughs> and white. I yeah, love that. Like a, yeah. a perfect recent example. You know, like the giant Gundam down in Odaiba? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took a picture. Like I was, I was doing the same pose as the Gundam. And then I put that in black and white. And I was like, yes, this is silly. Cool. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong. I, these are all creative yeah. choices. Who cares? But, Absolutely. Uh, but people do have associations. And if you don't know what the associations are, maybe it, it doesn't translate for people. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, black and <laughs> color, black and white, this kind of stuff. Uh, weakness. Also, too, like I get, I will say I get almost angry or I get indignant when I see, which is a recent trend, it's very common, a very serious issue, like, you know, domestic violence or something like this. And you have these women who are literally like beaten and by the person that loves them. And you have them posed like, like there's some champion on a hill or something like that. It's, it looks like if I put Abercrombie or if I put some brand across the bottom gap, you would think it was an ad. And for me, I feel like that does a disservice to that story because you don't have to make them also look like poor suffering, you know, old Caravaggio paintings where people are like, oh, crying and stuff, but like mm-hmm. a little bit of levity, mm-hmm. or uh, not levity, excuse me, gravitas, like, you know, a little bit of keep it, the tone isn't right for me because I understand the, the intention is to empower this person or to make them not look weak uh, mm-hmm. because something happened to them. This is just one example, but, um, yeah, but posing if, them in I, can, if I can put a good thing is if I can put a logo or if I can put like Coca-Cola across the top and it looks like it might work for me I feel like you need to make a different creative choice to express the pain that is real for that person and not just a a photo project for you that's like almost imposing your style that you learned in you know your master's of photography program onto an issue where maybe for me at least seems dis. mm -hmm it doesn't work or it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. And I think there is a power to documentary photography that requires restraint and, and uh, getting yourself out of the witnessing of that, or these people are allowing you into their lives. They're allowing you to do, they're telling you very personal things. They're telling the, the journalists very personal things and you're presenting them in a way that looks fake and there's or too pretty it's just too pretty like it's too clean and Mm -hmm. their life in if it's in this case their life wasn't clean their life was difficult and messy and tragic and you're Mm -hmm. making it look like a benetton ad you know i i I don't think that's good Uh, i see so kind of again my personal opinion there's a lot of stuff that works it's an important question that's been raised uh I've read, I've read this question raised uh, with similar topic in the case of like uh, looking at um, children who are suffering from extreme poverty yeah. uh, and like the ethics of photographing a child uh, that is obviously malnourished. You know, how do yeah, you yeah. approach I that situation? That. Yeah. How, do yeah. you, how do you communicate uh, this dire situation and encourage people to try to help? Uh, yeah. while not interfering, like what is, yeah. what is the role of the photographer? 
Uh, it's a really important yeah. question to ask. Wasn't wasn't that specific issue that he he um, this is I know the exact story you're talking about where the guy took a picture of the little uh, kid in I don't know Ethiopia or somewhere Yemen. I, I don't, don't know. remember. Um, remember. Somewhere he was starving. The kid was starving. It was yeah. a very graphic photo. Yeah. yeah, it was very hard to look at. And then did he help the kid afterwards, or he didn't? I can't remember what people were angry. About. I don't. I I remember the discussion. Uh, okay. Anyway, at the, about the ethics uh, more more strongly, but uh, yeah. well, that is another is another good question. Uh, but the I think that like as you're saying with the accessibility yeah. of, of of photography, uh, it does become hard, especially in this era, the social media era, to t like remove your ego from, yeah. from the situation. And yeah. uh, another key question that's come up several times in this series is uh, forcing yourself to think about your goal. So it's like, mm. is your goal, uh, to put it in the words of a translator who is in here, uh, Emily. Yeah. Emily uh, ah, I know Emily. Is your, yeah. yeah, is your goal, <laughs> yeah. He said, is your goal to be popular on the internet or is your goal to be the best translator you can possibly be? Exactly. So it's another important yeah. question that you have to ask yourself, you know, regardless yeah. of whatever creative form you're yeah, pursuing. What is I, your goal? I, I always think about it as like, uh, you know, if you're doing it because you want to be something rather than you're doing something because you want to do something, you know, like if you want to be something that's perfectly fine, it's actually more motivating probably because you have this thing you want to become, this identity, especially when you're younger, it's important to have that drive of like, I'm going to be this someday. Um, but the thing that's gonna sustain you is not people, not accolades. Because if, you, uh, if the accolades stop or the praise stops, are you gonna still do it? Or are you gonna stop doing it? If you're yeah, going to stop sure you, doing it. Exactly. I'm sure that you're familiar with the very famous David Bowie interview, the Never Play to the Gallery interview. Have you seen that? Oh, I, possibly, but it's that not. That is not required my... viewing. Everybody who's listening okay. or watching has to go and Google David Bowie Never Play to the Gallery. It's like a minute clip, but he's talking okay. about how, uh, as an artist, you have to always essentially do the thing that you feel that uh, is, your, is your creative work. So if you are, okay. if you are doing something... Uh, purely to appease other people, it's just not going to work, you know? Yeah. It's not the thing. Or it'll be, it'll be derivative. I mean, it's, that's the problem with social media and Instagram, isn't it? Because I, I feel it too, man. I, if I get a like, it feels good. And I start thinking, oh, this one got 100 likes. This one <laughs> right? got 50 likes. Everyone is prone to it. Even uh -huh. the fam most famous photographers, I don't care. Absolutely. They definitely like when people like their photographs. Of that's course, why you, we all want to be liked, you know? We're social that's creatures cool. by nature. Absolutely. If that's driving your work, if the cart becomes the horse. Because mm, I think you have to kind of walk a fine line because most of us are not David Bowie and we will never become David Bowie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, we like to think of, of ourselves as David, David Bowie. Bowie. That's guaranteed. And so yeah. while I think that all of us can aspire to a level where we don't have to care about, yeah. you know, marketability, I think that most of us still have to consider how uh how to market our skills you know Absolutely. how to it's... how to make other people want to participate or how to make other people want to look at or listen to whatever like we're not yeah. all david bowies <laughs> unfortunately no. for better or for worse so you know how yeah. do you how do you um find that line for yourself i think it's a really important thing to consider and to reconsider from time to time for sure absolutely yeah but this relates to see i'm yeah. segueing to oh, you're good you're uh, natural to uh just because our time is going real quick phew yeah, lots of good topics chatting. but i wanted yeah. to ask you uh, w with regard to this topic then you've worked for a big uh you know media outlets yeah you mentioned the bbc uh you yeah. did a piece uh for uh, you've done work for vice uh yeah. vanity fair in italy yeah. uh, and many more but yeah. uh, i wanted just from like a less from like an artistic perspective more kind yeah. of from the perspective of maybe somebody who's watching or listening that's thinking like how do i even begin to work with yeah. like those big media outlets how do i how do i even like approach them how do i pitch them like how did you make those connections to get yeah. your work uh seen by you know the readers and uh, viewers of those media outlets i asked i like i asked other people who were, who were doing it i just wrote to people um part of the experience institute prototyping program that I did for that year was was they taught you how to approach people like via okay. email and then I got some tips and some hints and luckily BBC uh BBC travel specifically has an author's brief if you google like BBC travel author's brief it should come up 
and they it's thorough it's like extremely thorough about what you must do for their for a pitch if you want to pitch them it's mm -hmm. like you got a story idea great here's what you have to have this 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 don't do this it's like a, a little mini master class on how to pitch and i think nice. if you follow follow that and do a like a more quick condensed version of that you're gonna get a lot of hits i was lucky mm -hmm. with bbc because i was uh, again japan sells itself kind of um, and I had enough photos to show them that they do at least the photos would be good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but p pitching people very succinctly, very cleanly, and not asking for anything, mm. I think. Like, make sure that you're telling them what you can give them. I see. Okay, nice. You know what I mean? That was a good, that was a real solid piece of advice. That's useful for a, a lot of people, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Other things, you've talked already, we've already talked a lot about uh, travel media. Yeah. and media, social media in general. But is there anything that you you think, you know, like um, you, you hope to see a change in terms of travel media or like uh, yeah. some way that you hope things are a bit different, especially, you know, post pandemic? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it, as we talked about, like it was a bit saturated um, with people who were kind of hobbyists or people who didn't, really need to be doing that taking up that space because for them they don't care one way or another they're going on that trip or you know the whatever they're stationed there you know um with for, for their job so they do this on the side which is okay but they're, they're weekend warriors or something i don't know um those people i think are gonna be kind of off now which mm. will maybe maybe i hope allow people who are very very serious and committed um and presumably maybe more experienced or more talented to get more deep articles out i think the checklist kind of stuff maybe i'm wrong i might be getting you know old and out of touch but like <laughs> the checklist I, this is my hope uh, let's just say it's my hopes the checklist kind of buzzfeed like these are the top 10 places we can all do that on google maps man we don't need you right i go right. there with my google maps and i i see the stars i go um, I don't need you anymore. I don't need a list. Mm -hmm. um, what I would like to read, and I, I think the, the success of long form articles, uh, the success of, you know, podcasts like serial podcasts, you know, those ones are really long in depth, really deep. Um, and a lot of podcasts dedicated to one topic in particular where they go really deep. Mm -hmm. I think that's, there's a market for that and maybe subscription services like you're doing with Patreon and stuff like that. Maybe that's, that's good. Um, that's my hope. I mean, I wish we could get back to, I don't want to say old travel writing because old travel writing obviously has all these, you know, problematic kind of outsider viewing colonialist, yada, yada. Uh -huh. uh, that's true. But the writing, the people who are writing Norman Lewis, I mean, if anybody's interested in reading travel writers from the past, Norman Lewis, an English writer, he did stuff on in, uh, in Sicily, the mafia, like, uh, Naples 44 is like post-war it's amazing he's doing like a report basically reportage but it's beautiful it's literature um, you know and I I still believe that there are some dividing lines between a blog and literature I know a lot of people it's all the same it's not um, Rebecca West uh, she did it's a very long book so this is not light reading and this is not really what I expect from people because it's like godhead for travel writing but um Rebecca West did something about Yugoslavia where it's, it's, she's writing ethnographies about, you know, uh, it, it's just beautiful writing and very informative. Something, a light version of that is what should be in like the New York times, mm -hmm. you know, a, a very, very light presentable version of that. Mm -hmm. um, Edward Hoagland, Edward Hoagland is a great uh, writer. He can be a little verbose, but he's really beautiful. He wrote um, about Canada before, you know, it was fully, domesticate or like colonized, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. where these people are living in like out, out, out in Canada, Canadian outback. And it's beautiful writing, stuff that stands the test of time instead of stuff that'll be thrown away. A um, listicle, <laughs> yet another one. A list, yeah, just yeah. like go back and go back and read uh, travel writing from even just pre-internet when stuff was actually had to be printed. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice a striking difference in the, in the level of writing. The, the, just how good the writing is, mm -hmm. purely. Mm. Um, I'd like to see a lot less I, a lot uh, less 
personal right. experience. I don't First care. Person. I don't know you. I don't mm -hmm. care what your experience is eating tacos. I want to know where do they source that meat? Like, you know, do some work. Like, uh, I, my hope is, is that's because you're going to get a lot of kind of hobbyists um, back doing other work that they enjoy, I'm hoping not just out of work, which is- I would also sad. guess that that's a product of uh, tight deadlines and a lot, of, totally. a lot of articles required in order to make ends meet. You know, you're just pumping out things as fast as you possibly can because you have to get- Talking about done. rates. It's exactly what we're talking about. I mean, why am I going to put, I've written articles and gotten paid nothing that were like, I was very proud of the writing in the article. And then I'm like, why did I do that? Mm. That is not worth my time. I just, mm -hmm. it is worth my time for me personally as, to feel good about myself for pride. Um, and it is a good, like, uh, it's a good calling card to show people. This is how much work I put in, even when I'm getting paid $50, $80 from certain publications in Japan that are in English, uh -huh. who can make a, you can't, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a blog. It's a glorified blog, which is nothing wrong with that, but don't present it, you know, as if you're, uh, living off of that as it's, well. Yeah. It's, it becomes little tidbits of information that are useful here and there. I like, um, I like listicles actually. Really? I, I, I tend to I, overstate things, but I, I generally, especially, Oh God, I'm going to help. Do it. Well, do it. To, from time to time. But like when I read, when I read a listicle about Japan, I will hate uh, click it immediately. Well, like when it comes up on Twitter, I'm like, Oh, I got to see what this person put on this list. Do you find, do you find that you get very protective, like territorial about Japan because it's so misrepresented all the time and you become like almost a, like uh, I get very protective. Like when I see cliches repeated over and over, I'm just like, don't say that about my hometown. <laughs> I wouldn't don't say know that I get protective about. as I'm just like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my if I see God. one more Blade Runner photography I'm so reference, I'm going to jump of off a cliff. Runner. Yeah, Blade Runner, okay. that's the one. Cool, you took purple and you went all the way over on Lightroom. Nice. Yeah. It's, that was, yeah. That's, I, Tokyo is not purple, everybody. I know. Tokyo's not purple. I know. It's not at all. Like, Never. I can, I appreciate it when, if an artist does choose to make like, you know, kind of like an artist's rendering or like they do like sure, a, sure, they do sure. a special illustration. It's like a Tokyo, video game background but, kind of. But they, yeah, they yeah. make it clearly, like they've clearly <laughs> drawn it with like pastel pinks and purples. Like it's a clear distinction between the way the city is and the yeah. way. Uh, well, that's, that's, that's a different thing. It's not a photo. It's, it's at but that there's point, still but... so many people and you were, you mentioned before it sells. It's absolutely true. You know, oh, it gets published in the New York times and thousands everywhere. of, like, you know, shares and likes on social media and everybody's going Blade Runner city. And I'm just like, uh, I, <sighs> I tried, I tried to say something once on Twitter and learned my lesson hard. I don't know who it was even. Cause I just blocked everybody really quickly. I was like, what yeah. was that? I got swarmed, I guess. I don't know. People, because people I, swarmed you. I was just like, these said... I was like, these colors are not, it was like a morning, a morning sunrise or something. And it was totally purple. And I'm like, there's no need to do that at night. Uh -huh. Okay. It, it jazzes it up. It looks cool. I get it. But like in a morning sunrise, nature in all its glory in Japan, and you made everything purple and it was just my eyes exploded. <laughs> and I was like, Tokyo is not this color. There's no skies anywhere in the world that are this color uh -huh. ever. There's and, a uh, whole movement going I around. I attacked. There's this whole like Neo Tokyo thing. And I'm trying to understand it because there's some people, there are people in my network <clears throat> now that are very interested in it. And they're, they're interested in like this intersection of uh, city and technology and media and, you know, creating these cool images and, you know, creating yeah. cool photos. And I'm trying to wrap my, that's kind of the latest thing. Like, you know, I'm trying to be not like, what is going on? What are you kids doing? Sort of person. thing. But I'm also <laughs> kind of like, I don't quite understand it yet. So, but at this, yeah, but I do, I do feel that the, the excess of Blade Runner references yeah. uh, with regards well, to Tokyo like, like, anyway. Before is, that it was, it was lost I'm in translation, bored. right? Like, I'm bored. it's just like, yeah, why make the same reference point? Lost in translation, lost in translation for like, uh, uh, still now, it was like 20 uh -huh. years now. And then like, you know, uh, yeah, Blade Runner as well. I'm like, I don't know. I don't, for me, like Wong Kar Wai movies are closer, even though they take place in Hong Kong. Those are a little more like, you know so, what I mean? They're very yeah, saturated but and rich. It's, but. Those, those are the kind of things, the stereotypes. That I, it's less that I feel protective. So it's more just that I feel bored and I wish we could move on totally. uh, to, other, Agreed, to yeah. other topics because we're just rehashing the same thing over and over, like a convenience Absolutely. store blog or a picture of a clear umbrella in the rain <laughs> it should be a crossing. 
So just like the know. zebra stripe, the zebra crossings, it's been done, guys. Like it's enough. Like so, if you get a good one, take the photo. Of course, always take the photo. I think, and then yeah, it's, it's, like, those are things everyone should experience. Everyone should get to experience did, the bright lights and the rain and all those things. I I understand it because it's aesthetic. It's beautiful, actually. But if you want to stand out or do something, find your oh God. This sounds like a horrible catchphrase for a for a ad campaign. Find your Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> but it's different for everyone. My Tokyo is not your Tokyo. Ours are, ours are closer sure. probably, but like, sure. it's not I, like my experience is not walking around in a Blade Runner fantasy. My you know, experience is hanging out with friends in uh, yeah. you know, a tiny little bar and like, yeah. but it's yeah. good to try. That's actually, I know we're just joking around, but that's actually a good thing for people to, I, maybe if you're just starting out or something, is something I tell friends or like when I do workshops or whatever is like, engaging your habit and like follow your habit to its conclusion like just go 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 so if you're like i know a, a photographer in in tokyo uh dan spara he's a very good good guy and uh he was doing stuff with just uh cones just the cones it's <laughs> pretty good and like the cones everywhere oh, he had a great name for it too i can't remember what the name was but uh if you look up dan spara and on his website i think it's there, okay it's like, uh, something about safety is really good Oh, that's um, cute. And just, that's cute. But he just explored it, and then, and then eventually he was exhausted by it, and he stopped, you know? Yeah. So it's like, it's yeah. just, if you're someone who likes to shoot photos very bright and too much flash, and you get a mistake one time, and you go, I like that mistake, mm. do that mistake a thousand iterations until, it, until you get sick of it, and then you have that body of work. Mm. Where is it going to live? What is it going to do? Who are you going to sell it to? You don't know, but you mm -hmm. have it to show people that you're kind of thinking a little differently, and I... I think it's yeah, worth you never know. exploring bad ideas. I agree. I agree. You explore yeah. and you don't know it's a bad idea until you get to the end of it. And you're like, yeah, no, that was a bad idea. <laughs> and you might <laughs> even you think it's a bad it. idea. Yeah. And then five years later, you look at it and you're like, this is beautiful. I, I used to take, uh, my commute was along the Keio line, which is along Tokyo Bay. So every morning I just like religiously, you could sometimes see Fuji across the bay, but I would just take these very minimalistic, um, low quality because it's an old iPhone, uh, horizon photos. I mean, a friend pointed out later, they're like, this is Sugi Mojo. And so, I go, oh, okay, it is. It's just like rule of thirds, um, whatever whatever is on the horizon. And every day, it was, it was never the same way twice. And I did those just out of habit, just for my friends, just mm -hmm. as something nice. Now I go back and I looked at those and I was like, oh my God, I got to collect all these. Like they're really low quality, but if I put them all together, like this is, this is gorgeous, minimal yeah, photography. Cool. Like, um, whereas at the time I thought they were throwaway, I didn't care about them. I was just uh, like, this is, I'm just doing a, it's a it's like doing color studies or something you know like when you're a painter you're just okay i need to learn to paint different shades of red so here's all the tomatoes and well it's just, practice you know Every you're not going to sell practice. that painting yeah, it's, mm. Mm. yeah okay I think well i think red. that you've been throwing tons and tons of uh, professional and creative advice out throughout this discussion so i want to yeah. move like to the last couple of questions because we've been talking for over an hour Woo. Oh, um sorry. <laughs> all good it's i want much to for me of any of it. I want to go to um, back to just the topic of working in other countries and working in other cultures. There are two yeah. sides to this question. First, what do you think are the joyful or the exciting aspects of working in another country or another culture? What is it that's attractive about it to you? Uh, I like that. Uh, maybe you find this. Not everyone agrees with me on this, but I am quite literally a different person in Japanese than I am in English I think mm -hmm. like I'm a different person there's some some of it transfers over but like when I'm speaking in a meeting in you know America I'm I'm a totally different person mm -hmm. I'll shout out whatever you know because the rules are different one but like also because just I don't know it's like your brain shifts it's code switching right I mean like everyone does it um that aspect is I, maybe this is too deep, but like, for me, it's like, it proves that there is no like stable identity or like there is no stable ego. It's fake. It's false. Like there's no narrative for who I am. I'm a completely different person in a different situation. If I get enough sleep or I don't get enough sleep, if I'm speaking Japanese, if I'm flailing in Italian, um, these aren't the same person. These are different people and they have different strengths and weaknesses, confidence levels, you know, um, I often say that like, uh, you know, Japan was like my third parent. It like, 
it taught me to tone it down. It like kind of shaved off the rough as edges and like mm-hmm. the, that American brashness, you know, that you, you need, you need mm-hmm. it in America. Actually going back to America, it was tough to shift back to being like a little bit more assertive. I would say, uh, sorry, 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 constantly. Mm-hmm. And my, my dad once out, he's like, stop saying sorry in your own house. You're making me feel bad. I think that I Japan, like, when I, when I reflect on things that, that, that being in Japan has taught me, one of the lessons that absolutely is kind of a, a softer approach to power, a totally. softer approach to, uh, um, and a more, um, how should I put this, patient approach uh, to your, to your discussions yeah. and to, I don't even like the word soft power, even. <laughs> that sounds it's very, like, in, It's indirect. It's just, as, but, it's, just mm. as, it's just as strong, sometimes stronger. So um, that's a very interesting thing. But the flip side of this question, then, too, yeah. is what do you find challenging about working in other countries and cultures? Oof. Uh, well, obviously, America is a very individualistic country. Um, so if you have that mother culture whispering in your ear all the time, there's a many times anyone who's lived in Japan especially can relate to like, you want to flip the table over and be like, listen, idiot. You know what I mean? And it's not, it's just that they are not going to give in to your personal proclivities. You need to adapt to this situation. The rules are set generally work within the confines, work within the restriction. Uh, in America, you kind of just blast through the, you say the restriction doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's a lot of countries like that, you know, maybe, maybe Netherlands or France or, other places where it's, it's viewed as leadership or good um, to, to have the, the left field idea and say it openly. Um, Italy is very individualistic like America, but it's very inconsistent. Like in my experience, I just, one minute everything's great, the next second everything's uh, wrong and like not good. And I'm like, it was fine a minute ago. Like what's going on? Why is everybody, you know, again, my own limitations, why is everybody freaking out now? Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times because of, lack of attention to detail or something like that but i like i like working on very loose i want to say stuff that is not like managerial in italy Mm -hmm. is way better is much better like vineyards or something if you go to vineyards or um these kind of places these kind of spheres are more um they're in their they're in their comfort zone and they're very good at what they do Mm-hmm. And they're extremely knowledgeable and they will, they will school you. And it's a very free flowing and easygoing trust based uh, business interaction or marketing interaction or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Um, that looseness is, I would say, even more uh, enjoyable than, than maybe in the States where it's like, we're very serious because we're putting a lot of money into this campaign and blah, blah, blah. Here they're like, I trust you. You do what you want, mm-hmm. you know? And you're like, wow, really? Like, I don't know how to do it. You know how to do that. I make the wine. Okay, bye. Like, <laughs> that's cool. That's and, cool. Yeah, if you're a creative, that's awesome. Because you're like, wow, I have carte blanche. I can do what I want. Right. Um, and that was kind of one of like the, one of my hypotheses actually in going into the series in general was that like, you know, in my experience too, working with kind of more cre- creative, less, you know, big companies, big business, big bureaucracy, like while those have, a, you know, there are wheels and rules and everything that make those things go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, make them efficient or whatever. Uh, yeah. It's often you, you got you have to be willing to play by those rules. And so that's very not attractive in some cases. Uh, and for many people, your personality type just doesn't fit so well with that. But I, I yeah. was curious about I've been curious about that. You know, why is it that, you know, people who are serious in creative fields, you know, there's it's, it's a very different uh, it's a different way of approaching your work and approaching even your collaborations, too. So that's yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah. to hear that uh, from a winery too. Oh, that sounds fun. Uh, yeah. But because uh, time is very, very long. <laughs> yeah, sorry, episode, I want to get to you the, can the, edit, the... You can edit out all the hums and haws and like, cut like five, <laughs> five minutes good. from it. That's an old trick I use in the radio. I just cut out all the breaths and then oh, you get down like two minutes. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to, I mean, like, uh, I know obviously, we both know obviously the world is in a bit of a, is a mid, what should I say? The world is in a lull, experiencing a lull. <laughs> So it's nice a real fixer it. upper. We, <laughs> we're in a <laughs> little work to be done situation at the moment. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, is there a next project that you're going to be working on or is there a next thing that you're hoping to pursue? Ah, I, I guess what I'm working on right now, just to give you an idea of like the kind of balance between like what I have to do for money and then what uh-huh. I, what I 
do for my own enjoyment or my own passions. Yeah, most. both. Uh, Basically, the question yeah. is, what what can people look out for? Uh, what can people yeah. expect to um, find? I am. To check you out? I did. I worked with uh, a fashion company called Golden Goose uh, here in Milan. They do shoes. Totally cool. not anything I've been involved in before. I did all the the copywriting. They have like a, a, a ostensibly it's a it's a guide to Argentina. Uh, which was interesting to try to do with mm -hmm. uh, the current situation, as we're calling it. Um, so that's coming out soon. So Golden Goose Guide to Argentina. Is, okay. I, I wrote that. Um, and then that's for paying the bills. But it was also very enjoyable, weirdly. Mm -hmm. It's one of the rare times that it worked. And Don't then you love that? When you get a cool job that also uh, pays your bills? Love that's it. The, that's, <laughs> that's the dream. The dream. <laughs> that's, that's the dream. You never get it, but it's the dream. Occasionally it, it coalesces. Mm -hmm. um and then i there is a everyone should follow this uh account on instagram it's shoichi underbar kudo underbar awamori like the place awamori awamori not, not okay. awamori the the drink awamori oh. oh awamori okay yeah yeah sorry shoichi kudo um and it is essentially like a vivian meyer type situation this guy was a a, a journalist for a local paper in the 50s so just after the war, just post-war, all black and white, um, was like group really poor, is not able to get any jobs because it's all credential based in Tokyo. So he, he's basically relegated to shooting his hometown. Took all these amazing time capsule photos, but they're beautiful photos too. You know, mm -hmm. it's not like they're just from that time. They're just gorgeous photos. Um, a real uh, unsung talent. Um, and his daughter, granddaughter, daughter uh kanako is running this instagram account which is now just picking up um so i wrote to her and asked her if i could have permission to sort of introduce that in english uh somewhere like the guardian or somewhere i'm pitching a lot of different editors to to write the story of this guy uh because first of all his personal story is amazing and then these photos if you see, i mean go and look at them and it's like mm. if you like japan at all or you like photography at all it's just like what a treasure trove um, and what and a really cool story, which I think there's nowhere in English to read it. So I'm I'm hopefully cool. gonna write that and introduce him. I have to talk with her next mm. month. But cool, yeah. awesome. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. That is awesome. So then the yeah. final the final 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 question is just where can people find you if they'd like to learn more about your work or see these projects Instagram's, that you talked about? Instagram's probably easiest. Yeah, okay. just uh, it's Lance Stein because my last name Henderstein is too long and. <laughs> Okay. Trouble surprise it's just Lance Stein. <laughs> Lance Stein. Okay, I'll put a yeah, link easy. to that in uh, the podcast description and the YouTube description. And yeah. anywhere anywhere else that we can find you, I will put that into uh, wherever wherever you'd yeah, like I me gotta to link to. Update my go. site. I'm very bad at marketing. <laughs> this is the the secret. The bad secret is I. Well, I'm awesome. Not good at marketing. That's yeah. okay. That's okay. You know. Yeah. So we all good do what we can. <laughs> good at emails. That's it. That's something. That's something. <laughs> yeah, it is something. <laughs> Okay. Well, I think All we'll right. wrap it up here, but if you'd like to yeah. add any final thoughts, now is your chance. Uh, no, I don't have any words of wisdom. Everybody's got to make their own mistakes and, and figure it out. We're all just winging it. We're all just figuring it out as it goes. And you can't predict anything in this year. Who knows? November might be much, much worse. Right? Let's hope not. But Let's hope not. Yeah. Let's hope not, but that Let's is Let's hope true. for a, be a better 2021. That's my, sure. my genuine hope. I really hope. Agree. Anyway, I will end the conversation there. So thank you again so All much right. for your time. That was a lot of Always fun. Always a pleasure, Alicia. Hope to see uh -huh. you very soon and in good health with everybody. For sure. Me too. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Non-Native Creative. If you liked this episode, please make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Feel free to leave comments about this episode in the comments section too. Please make sure to stop by the project Patreon at patreon.com slash non-native Patrons can get access to Patreon-only discussions, bonus behind-the-scenes media, interview transcripts, and access to patron-only live streams. Your support will help make sure the series can continue to share exciting, interesting stories from creative people working across borders. Thanks again for watching. See you next week.